Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Clinton Presidential Center. I'm Stephanie Street, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Clinton Foundation. And we're so thrilled to have all of you with us this evening as we unveil our newest exhibit, The Secret Art of Dr. Seuss. Through May 22nd, visitors will be treated to a rare glimpse into the artistic life of a celebrated American icon, Dr. Theodore Seuss Geisel, a.k.a. Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss's clever rhyme and meter, dynamic and engaging characters, and most importantly, his beautiful underlying messages have struck a chord with readers for almost seven decades. The Secret Art of Dr. Seuss chronicles Geisel's career through his artwork as well as his words. Additionally, it offers a larger-than-life view of Dr. Seuss's most famous characters, the Cat in the Hat, the Grinch, Sam I Am, Yertle the Turtle, and the Lorax. The Clinton Center is absolutely thrilled to be the venue for this amazing exhibit, especially during the height of field trip season here in Arkansas. As you may know, March the 2nd is Dr. Seuss's birthday, and we have a fun-filled week of activities planned for the 41 schools representing 2,600 children who will be visiting us that week alone. So we're very much looking forward to that, aren't we, Terry? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Bill Dreyer. Along with his position as director and curator for the art of Dr. Seuss, he is recognized as the leading authority on the art of Dr. Seuss. His research has focused on prominent public and private collections, including the Dr. Seuss Estate, the Dr. Seuss Archives at the University of California, San Diego, the Lyndon Baines Johnson Presidential Library, as well as important private collections. As a 20-year art world veteran, he has spent the past decade researching the life and art of Dr. Theodore Seuss Geisel. Following Bill's presentation, you will all have the opportunity to ask him questions. So please join me in welcoming Bill Dreyer to the Clinton Presidential Center. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you to the wonderful staff here at the Clinton Library and the Foundation. It's a real pleasure to be here, especially to be able to bring Theodore Seuss Geisel and all of his wonderful, wacky, inventive humor. Ted Geisel began his illustration career as a little-known cartoonist in the 1920s. His intriguing perspective and his fresh concepts ignited his career and his work evolved quickly from simple illustrations to modeled sculpture and sophisticated paintings of elaborate imagination. His unique artistic vision emerged as the golden thread which linked every facet of his career and his artwork became the platform from which he delivered 44 children's books, 400 World War II editorial cartoons, uh, hundreds of uh, editorials filled with wonderfully inventive animals, characters, and humor. This exhibition does offer a rare glimpse into his artistic life, and it chronicles, as Stephanie said, seven decades of this work that in every respect is uniquely, stylistically, and endearingly Seussian. Um, first panel I want to go to in the exhibition is the, the Hundred Year Timeline. And this highlights all the different milestones in his career, and you'll get a chance, of course, in the exhibition to take a look at that. Uh, uh, but what I want to focus on right now is a very early part of that career. And chronologically speaking, this exhibition starts one decade before he writes his first children's book and about two years after he graduates from Dartmouth College. Do we have any Dartmouth College graduates here? There's usually one in every room. <laughs> <laughs> After college, um, Ted's father, uh, I'm going to go back one second here. After college, uh, Ted's father asked him, what are your intentions now that you've graduated from college? And he fibbed that he had won a uh, fellowship to Oxford, <laughs> which he was hoping for, but he hadn't yet won. 
His father went across the street to the editor of the newspaper and shared this good news, and it arrived in the Springfield Union the very next day. Uh, Ted did not end up winning this uh, fellowship, so to save, fa to save face, his father had to find a way to get him to Oxford. He paid for it. <laughs> Ted attended Oxford with the intention of getting a doctorate in literature, but after a two-hour lecture on the punctuation of King Lear, he decided maybe traveling Europe is a better education for me, personally. And that's exactly what he did. He actually traveled Europe for a year. He left college, and after a year he comes back home, and he doesn't know quite what to do with himself, but he knows he loves to illustrate and draw. And so he starts send sending cartoons out to the magazines of the day. And this is where Ted Geisel's life takes a fortuitous turn. In 1927, Saturday Evening Post sends him $25 for the first cartoon that was ever purchased, and that becomes his first published cartoon. He says, aha, that's it, I'm moving to New York. So with 25 bucks and all of his savings, he moves to New York, and within a short period of time, a couple of months, he gets a job with Judge Magazine. Does anybody remember Judge Magazine? 40s, 50s. And it was um, a, a humor, humor magazine of the day, and he lands a job there as an editorial cartoonist, and within a few months he starts to make fun of a bug spray called Flit. Does anybody remember the Flit bug spray? <laughs> flit bug spray. What was the catchphrase? Does anybody remember? Quick Henry the Flit. And Ted Geisel was making fun of this bug spray. The wife of the advertising executive that handled the Flit bug spray account saw these cartoons, these parodies of her husband's product, and she gave it to her husband and said, this guy is funny, you should hire him. And that's exactly what he did. Within one year of his first professionally published cartoon, Ted Geisel has landed a national advertising campaign with Standard Oil of New Jersey, who happens to be the manufacturer of Flit bug spray. By the end of 1928, he's making $12,000 a year, a princely sum. He's 24 years old. This advertisement is the first advertisement that he did, and it shows a little girl and her brother in the front yard, and the father's hanging out the window going, whoa, 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 what's going on out there? And the little girl says, don't worry, Papa. Willie just swallowed a bug, and I'm having him gargle with flit. If there are any lawyers in here, you know, what's the liability on that one? <laughs> this also goes down in advertising history, and it's a little known fact. This advertisement is the first ad to use humor to sell a product. So Dr. Seuss's contribution to the advertising world is humor. Does anybody know what this character of this book is? The Lorax? And what's the Lorax about? Protecting the environment, exactly. Well, 24 years before Ted Geisel writes The Lorax, he is uh, creating an advertisement for Flit Bug Spray, which is one of his quick Henry the Flit advertisements. But what I like in particular is that he has the Improve with DDT. <laughs> so our champion of environmental concerns was promoting the use of DDT to be sprayed on your children to protect them from bugs. On his way to becoming one of the world's most successful children's book authors, Ted Geisel established a distinct repertoire of imagery in the 1920s and 30s that continued to appear in artworks throughout his career. And you can almost see, this is a, a cover on Judge Magazine in 1929, and then also you can see uh, in 1933 another cover these are the images that we know and love from his children's books. Artistically speaking, Seuss does not talk down to kids with simplified imagery for his children's books. Everything he does has the same Seussian sensibility. And the golden thread that runs through his artistic and literary creations is this unique, whimsical, wacky, and wonderful view of looking at the world. 
This is one of Ted's famous quotes and a guiding principle in his life. I like nonsense. It wakes up the brain cells. Fantasy is a necessary ingredient in living. It's a way of looking at life through the wrong end of a telescope, which is what I do. And that enables you to laugh at life's reality. This is the philosophy that applies to almost everything that he does, including his advertising works. He had this national advertising campaign with Standard Oil of New Jersey, and they did not allow him to do any additional advertising or national ads. But he did note that in his contract, it didn't say anything about local advertising campaigns. So he found the loophole, and he began doing all sorts of local ads. In fact, he did ads for NBC Radio, General Electric, Ajax, uh, Holly Sugar, Chilton Pens, Ford, and many, many more. And his advertisements also set the stage for some of the artworks that would later appear in his books. Uh, this is a 1949 Ford Motor advertisement. Um, and if you'll notice this character here with that stick and that glove, does anybody recognize what that might look like? Who is that? Do you know? Who does that look like? It does look like that, but it also looks like, you might notice, Sam I Am from Green Eggs and Ham. Uh, by the way, Green Eggs and Ham, I just want to take another quick uh, diversion here. And Green Eggs and Ham was written with his publisher. Many of you may remember Bennett Cerf was the publisher of Random House for many years. And Bennett Cerf, he um, actually bet Ted Geisel 50 bucks that he couldn't write a book using 50 words or less. And Ted Geisel worked on this book for a long time. And he finally nailed it and came up with it. And when you think about this book, I would not eat them with a goat. I would not eat them on a boat. I would not eat them here or there. I would not eat them anywhere. It is just word conservation. He is repeating himself all the time to try and win that bet. And when I've researched the original concept drawings in the archives, you see on every page he is writing, he's drawing the artwork, and then he writes how many words. And you'll see three words, two words, five words. And he does win the bet, and uh, Ted Geisel's version of the story is that Bennett Cerf never paid him. Uh, this is also another um, cartoon, or actually it's another advertisement he did for Daggett and Ramsdale. They are a beauty products company. And you'll see that grandmothers come into the contraption, and then they pour in liquefying cream, skin tonic, lipstick, finishing powder, and they come out into the arms of young men as these beautiful young ladies who are being awaited with flowers. That shows you the kind of advertising that Ted Geisel would create. Also in the early 1930s, and just a reminder, we're still many years before he writes his first book in 1937. So in the 1937s, when, he, when he's doing these advertisements, he also embarked on this ingenious project where he evolves from two-dimensional artworks to three-dimensional sculptures. Uh, his father was the zookeeper, or actually the superintendent of the zoos, at the Forest Park Zoo in Springfield, Massachusetts. And when animals would die, his father would give Ted the horns, the beaks, the antlers, the shells of these deceased animals, and, and Ted kept them in a, in a box, and he eventually decided he would make what he thought these animals would want to be reincarnated as. And he calls this his collection of unorthodox taxidermy. Here he is with the sea turtle, a couple of other sculptures in the early 30s. This is the blue-green abelard. Uh, also, in 1938, Life magazine did a two-page spread on Dr. Seuss as the world's most eminent authority on unheard of animals. Seuss has only published two children's books at this point, and he was far from being known, let alone famous, for his books. And the article does not note him as the children's book author. It notes him uh, as Dr. Seuss from Quick Henry the Flit fame. This is the goo-goo-eyed Tasmanian woolgast, the Andalovian grackler, 
And as you can tell, Seuss gives them his wonderfully crazy names. This is the two-horned Druberhanus, the semi-normal green-lidded fawn, the tufted gustard, and the tufted gustard actually did not have an animal part. It had the old style shaving brushes and it was his father's last shaving brush which he then took and used as the tuft of the tufted gustard. He also created uh, another series called the Marine Mugs where he created these ferocious fish and he ended up using them in a boat show campaign that he did at the 1938 New York City motorboat uh, show uh, and included fish like the flaming herring. It looks like it's about to burst onto fire and fire. Uh, he also created at this time, because I believe he was getting really great feedback about his taxidermy sculptures, although he only created 17 that we know of at this point. But people love them, and he also saw this as a commercial opportunity, so he did a mail order collection of sculptures. He mass produced three different sculptures the tufted gustard, the Mulberry Street unicorn, and the blue green abelard, and he put an advertisement in the 1938 Look magazine, and this is it. it, says, extra, extra, Dr. Seuss returns from the Bobo Isles with rare and amazing trophies for the walls of your game room, nursery, or bar. <laughs> Unfortunately, the project was a failure, and very few of them sold, uh, probably because of their high price of $3.75, $4.75, but $15 for the Blue Green Avalar, so that was just, I'm sure, out of reach. Today, it's very rare that you find any of those. There is only one known complete set of these sculptures, and it was found in a chicken coop in upstate New York in 2004. It's now at auction for $1 million. Or should I say $1 million. And uh, I assure you, I've seen them. They are not in good condition. <laughs> Ted Geisel launched his career as an author with four published books between 1937 and 1940. But because of World War II, his next book, McGallagher's Pool, would not arrive for seven years. World War II had an unmistakable impact on Geisel's themes and the quality of his work from this point forward. He felt that he really needed to dedicate himself to the war effort. And it wasn't because he was a huge advocate of war, it was because he felt we needed to stop Hitler. And between 1941 and 1943, the way that he starts this effort is he writes over 400 World War II editorial cartoons in a daily newspaper called the PM Daily Newspaper that was started by Ralph Ingersoll. And Art Spiegelman wrote in the introduction to Dr. Seuss Goes to War, more of a humanist than an ideologue, one of those Groucho rather than Karl Marxists, Dr. Seuss made these drawings with the fire and honest indignation of anger that fuels all real political art. If they have a flaw, it's an absolutely endearing one. They're funny. This cartoon shows uh, Uncle Sam talk, talk, talking because as um, as you recall, uh, the walk up to World War II, FDR was fighting the isolationists, the America First group that was actually trying to keep us out of the war. Uh, and the argument was ended on December 7th, 1941, when Pearl Harbor happened. And though Seuss was a liberal opponent of racism, some of his early depictions of Japanese, blacks, Italians were of the day, shall we say, uh, including this one, which has really racist stereotypes that were done very commonly in the 1920s and 30s and into the 40s. Uh, one of the other ironies, though, of, of Seuss's history is that he was one of the first to address racial discrimination at this very same time. And another of the cartoons that came out about a year later is this. What this country needs is a good mental insecticide. And here is Uncle Sam pointing uh, his flit bug spray into the ear of the first person in line and the American public is all lined up. And he's blowing out the racial prejudice bug. And the guy is saying, good gracious, was that in my head? Absolutely. 
And this is one of the earliest editorial cartoons that encouraged self-reflection on racial prejudices. Another one of my favorite um, cartoons is, is this one here, done in 1942. And it shows Uncle Sam, again, looking over Congress, and they're all running about trying to calculate and figure things out and measure and add and subtract. And the name of this is The Naughty Problem of Capitol Hill, Finding a Way to Raise Taxes Without Losing a Single Vote. <laughs> Sixty-eight years later, the 112th Congress finds itself in the same predicament. And this is something that you do find with Ted Geisel's work. He is clearly uh, evergreen in his ideas. This is a little piece that I found in private collection that had been done on a little memo pad for his friend. In fact, it says, Headquarters Army Service Forces Memo Routing Slip. And it appears to me that he's telling us where we should route this memo. <laughs> A critical study can be given on any number of visual or conceptual themes running throughout Geisel's book, works. Tolerance, empower, empowerment, creativity, the environment are but a few. This panel isolates Geisel's commentary on the economy. Uh, he created, in 1938, this unpublished four-page novelet with a title of The Sad, Sad Story of the Obsks. And this is a great alliteration from Dr. Seuss. An obsks is a big bird, and it's spelled O-B-S-K-S. -S. So if you can say that, obsks. And the story goes like this. A flock of obsks from down in Nobsks hiked up to Bobsks to look for jobsks. <laughs> then back to Nobsks with sighs and sobsks. There were in Bobsks no jobsks for obsks. <laughs> this is where I think Ted Geisel really shows his genius in the alliteration the wordplay, the rhyming schemes that, of course, are so familiar to us with his children's books. An illustrator by day, a surrealist by night, Seuss created an irrepressible body of work that redefines himself as an iconographic American artist. Yet the secret art shows a side that most readers have not seen. In 19... 96, Mrs. Audrey Geisel allowed the first glimpse at these artworks. And the secret art is the collection of paintings and sculptures that he did at night for himself that he rarely, if ever, exhibited during his lifetime. Ted was a bit of a workaholic, and he would work all day and sometimes well into the night. But to relax, what he did is he painted and we saw the picture of him standing at this painting, actually. And Audrey Geisel, his widow, has told me that he would stand at this painting for several years and always go and paint another cat and step back and look and find another place we could put another cat. And even at the end, I can find little heads of cats with the eyes not completed on it. So it was really never finished, and I don't think he ever intended to finish it. This collection of work is really what um, is, in my opinion, the, the meat of the art of Dr. Seuss. We know and love his children's books, but one of the most fun elements of this exhibition is seeing what he was doing for himself at night. This is Joseph Katz in a coat of many colors. <laughs> alley cat for a very long alley. Indistinct cat with cigar. This is like a keyhole looking into Venice, Italy, and there's a cat at the bottom with, in a gondola. And this is called Venetian cat singing O Solo Meow. <laughs> cat, cats were just prevalent in his, in his work, and he was asked a number of times, why so many cats? And he'd say, because I can't draw dogs. <laughs> But Ted Geisel was um, very shy when it came to public interviews, and he actually made up more stories than, than, than were actually true. And one of the difficulties of researching him is that he was interviewed a number of times, but he really made stories up and it reported as fact. And it's kind of high, hard to decipher what's real and what's not. This is a greenish cat on a pinkish pot and a pinkish cat on a greenish pot. These, these works here are actually in a new book that 
uh, arrived today at the museum. Uh, we've been working on it for the past five years, and Mrs. Geisel actually gave me permission to go in and photograph the last 50 artworks that are in the collection that she hasn't shown or publicly published. And we've been working on this for several years, also going into private collection and finding other works that were uh, unknown to the day. Uh, and this book is really, I think, one of the best looks at his artistic legacy. Uh, and, and these are a couple of fun images that come in, and a few others include this one here. This is an artwork that Audrey's kept very near and dear to herself. It's in their, uh, it's in their, their master bedroom, and it's on a bureau. She's always kept it close. And you guys know the, the little cat cradle game, string game? Well, it's a cat in a cradle doing the cat cradle. <laughs> This is, uh, the name of this artwork is Green Cat with Lights, but we only asked Audrey two months ago, why did he sign his name at the bottom, Strugu Van M? And when we were doing this book and finalizing it, we were asking some of these questions, and, and she said, oh, Ted used to like to put that artwork in the living room, and, you know, he never really liked to have, uh, to, he didn't want to ask people what they thought of his artwork because obviously they're going to say, I love your artwork, it's great. He wanted honest feedback on his work. So he would put that in the living room and people would come in and go, what's this? And he goes, that's my Strugu Van M. <laughs> and it gave him an opportunity to hear what they really thought about his artwork. Of course, the most iconic cat is the cat in the hat, which appeared in 1957. This cat completely changed the way that generations of children would learn to read. And in the August 2007 issue of New York, of New York U.S. News and World Report, they declared 1957 to be a year that changed America. And the article focused on ten disparate events. Among them were the Cold War, Soviet Sputnik launch, the Dodgers and Giants leaving California, leaving New York for California growing racial tensions hitting their peak right here in Little Rock, Arkansas, and a former ad man, Dr. Seuss, revolutionizing the way that children would learn to read. Not only was the cat in the hat a major icon, it was an alter ego for Ted because he was an incredible prankster and a mischievous, wily cat himself. Uh, I can sh certainly share some of his prankster stories with you if you ask later, but one of them uh, I'll tell you right now is uh, when he lived in New York, he actually went to visit a friend of his who he knew was out of town for a week, and he snuck into this guy's apartment. And it was wintertime, so he opened the window, and then he filled the bathtub up with hot water, and then he put gelatin, sliced fruit, and about 12 goldfish in there. And his friend came back a week later to the largest tub of sliced fruit and goldfish jello in the world. <laughs> this is another alter ego of his. This is an artwork in the exhibition called Cat from the Wrong Side of the Tracks. Again, it's that mischievous cat. And, and I love this artwork. And we actually have to look at his works pretty, pretty close and pretty hard because uh, he didn't leave writings about each painting and what they were. These are all for his own enjoyment. But this is clearly the bad cat. He's smoking a cigarette, playing pool in the pool hall, and when you see the artwork down there, he actually has a, a nudie cat on his tie. <laughs> but if cats have nine lives, the score in this cat's life is eight, and he's down to his last life. The cat is not the only alter ego. The Grinch is also an alter ego of Ted. And it's often forgotten that in 1957, Ted did not write just one book. He also published How the Grinch Stole Christmas, delivering not one but two iconic books in the same year literally supercharged his career. And if there's any question that the Grinch is one of his alter egos, you just have to listen to the, the words in the book. Ted Geisel wrote this book when he was 53 years old, and the Grinch in the book says, Why, for 53 years I've put up with this now. I must stop this Christmas from coming, but how? That's Ted Geisel. And the reason he wrote this book is because he felt that Christmas was getting out of hand, and the over-commercialization of the holiday had just filled him up to here, and he needed to write about it. An interesting other tidbit about the Grinch is that Ted lamented that 
Today, in American vernacular, the Grinch is the bad guy. He's the villain. But he would always say, can't people see that the Grinch in my story is the hero of Christmas? Sure, he starts out as a villain, but it's not how you start out that counts. It's what you are at the finish. I'm also here to tell you that uh, the Grinch is alive and well in La Jolla, California. I had breakfast with Audrey Geisel at the La Valencia Hotel a couple of years ago, and at the end of the breakfast she said, Bill, come out front, I want to show you the Grinch. And so I walked out front with Audrey, and <clears throat> there is a 1985 silver Cadillac Seville with a license plate, Grinch. I'm pretty sure that Audrey Geisel can own any car she wants, but she drives the same car that she and Ted had for many years and is now 26 years old. It's the car they drove around town together in. Seuss also did a wonderful series of artworks called his La Jolla Birdwoman series. When he moved from New York to California, he immediately starts to make good-natured fun of the California socialites and their 11 known La Jolla bird woman paintings. This one is uh, very common with a lot of his works where you don't quite know what's going on until you read the punchline or the story that's underneath there. And she's on the phone in there and it says, what she's saying, she's saying, I'd love to go to the party but I'm absolutely dead. <laughs> He used to also watch his neighbors compete on their houses and gardens and landscapes. This is called, My Petunia Can Lick Your Geranium. <laughs> this is sunbathing bird, raising money for the arts. Martini bird, because after all, every woman in La Jolla walks around the house in a negligee with a teddy bear in one hand and a martini in the other hand. Ted Geisel gives a wink, wink, nudge, nudge in almost everything he does, and underneath that negligee is a not-so-sexy Lederhosen type contraption, and the socks, which are falling down around her ankles, are clearly not that sexy. <laughs> it's hard to pin down Ted Geisel's art artistic style, but he's a surrealist for sure, but he also ventures into representational works, abstraction, expressionism, but either way, Seuss delivers a feast of visual stunners dense with ideas. This is a wonderful abstract that Audrey allowed us to put in the book that had not been shown before, and if you look, you'll see there's a cat in a bubble right over here, hanging out, just chilling. This is the joyous leaping of uncanned salmon. <laughs> This is called, Every Girl Should Have a Unicorn. And if you look, you'll actually see that there is a unicorn right here. And she's riding her unicorn in the painting there. This is called, Fooling Nobody. And this tells you a lot about Ted Geisel, because no matter how big or inflated or indifferent you're trying to make yourself, you're fooling nobody. His message was, be yourself. This is called The Economic Situation Clarified, done in about 1975. And uh, it's similar to the Flock of Obsks, where they're upright and happy as they're marching up the town of Bobsks, but they're dejected and hunched over when they're going back to their own town. And this is showing us that when the economy is going up, they're upright, the tufts on their necks are fluffed up, and when the economy is going down, they're hunched over and frowning and sad. And Ted Geisel is actually poking fun at us for allowing the economy and the stock market to dictate our emotions up and down and up and down. Some pretty good medicine from the good doctor. The uh, Prayer for a Child artwork is a painting that he actually was published in Collier's Magazine in 1955. It's painted from the perspective of, perspective of one small child's place in the universe. And the poem that went along with this goes like this. From here on earth, from my small place, please tell all men. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped over. From here on earth, from my small place, I ask of you, we out in space. Please tell all men in every land what you and I both understand. Please tell all men that peace is good. That's all that need be understood. In every world, in your great sky, we understand, both you and I. The 
The last book that Ted Geisel wrote in 1990, before he died in 1991, is called All the Places You'll Go. And this final send-off is an amazing story of empowerment, but it's also a realistic tale that tells you that kids are going to have ups and down, downs, you're going to get into slumps, you're going to have bang-ups and hang-ups, but in the end, the book asserts, will you succeed? Yes, you will, indeed. 98 and three quarters percent guaranteed. <laughs> Kid, you'll move mountains. Have any of you ever received that book before? This book has been on the New York Times bestseller list every year since 1990 when it was published. It's given, of course, as graduation gifts, as retirement gifts, and I think it's a wonderful sentiment and a great message for people of any age. At the end of Ted Geisel's life, his biographers asked him if there were any messages or slogans that he would want to leave behind, and he thought about it and he said, Whenever things go a bit sour in a job I'm doing, I always tell myself, you can do better than this. The best slogan I can think of to leave with the kids of the U.S. of A. would be, we can and we've got to do better than this. It's been 75 years since Ted Geisel passed away, yet his lasting legacy remains a vital component of our social and educational culture. His influence on the 20th and 21st century American art scene was profound, with many of today's artists citing Dr. Seuss as a key influence in their own artistic development. Audrey Geisel uh, oversaw the installation of the Dr. Seuss National Memorial in Springfield, Massachusetts in 2002, and Ted Kennedy was there, and I got to watch him cut the ribbons to open that up, and it's a wonderful tribute to uh, his books. Uh, and just a few years ago, Mrs. Geisel gave us the blessing to create other celebrations of Seuss's artistic legacy through the large-scale bronze sculpture project. Uh, you may have seen some of them out there in the lobby, and there are some on the second floor and the third floor as well. Uh, and these homages are really great tributes to his books, his characters, and his lasting messages. Here's an eight-foot cat in a hat bronze at the Hotel Del Coronado. It's a 12-foot green, egg, green eggs and ham sculpture at a library in Chicago. Now, this is a uh, sculpture, I think a six-foot green eggs and ham, I believe at a private residence in Switzerland, is that correct, Mary? Switzerland. The Lorax. Of course, the Grinch and Max, his dog. The Yurt of the Turtle, Turtle Tower. Horton the Elephant will be coming out this year. In, and of course, if anybody is interested in putting a tribute, a sculpture in your community, your home, I'd be happy to talk to you about that at any point later. <laughs> but the reality is that it's a treat to be able to bring these to different communities. And I was able to bring a cat in a hat bronze to at Vanderbilt Children's Hospital last year, and it was a pretty powerful moment when we unveiled it and we had a little reception, and uh, a young boy came around the corner, and he's pulling his pole and his IV, and he walks through the hall, and he walks up to the cat, and he starts laughing and jumping around with his sister on the sculpture. They walk around it three times and walked away. All of us who were there unveiling the sculpture looked at each other and went, that's exactly what it's all about right there. In 2010, Life Books selected Dr. Seuss as one of the 100 people who changed the world. Seuss was the only children's book author taking his place alongside Michelangelo, Picasso, Shakespeare, Beethoven, and Elvis. And I've got to tell you, the Clinton Library is pretty hip because they're doing the Seuss exhibition now, and this summer they've got Elvis coming up. So if you want to know the important people that are changing the world, come to the library here. Dr. Seuss's publisher, Bennett Cerf, said that of the many distinguished authors that he published at Random House, and that included the American novelist Eugene O'Neill, I mean the American playwright Eugene O'Neill, and the novelist William Faulkner, he said, alone among them, Dr. Seuss was the genius. And Ted would say, if I'm the genius, why do I have to work so hard? Ted also said that children want the same things we want, to laugh, to be challenged, to be entertained and delighted. I don't write for children, he once said. I write for people. As his biographers wrote, 
in the end, what drove Ted, I think, was to be useful to the world. He sent those wacky warriors out to wage the battles of the underdog with whom he always felt a kinship. The battles against illiteracy, against environmental ruin, against greed, against conformity, against the arms race. He taught generations of children that it was fine to be different and it was even better to do good, but that all should have some fun about it. I want to thank Stephanie Street and Terry Garner for bringing the exhibition here and also to your extremely capable staffs who have been wonderful. It's really a joy to have this exhibition here at the library. Thank you so much. Do we have time for a question or two? I don't know what our time is. Do we have? I'd, I'd like to open it up and just uh, see if there's a couple of questions because there's always a couple of good ones and I'd like to see if anybody has a question. Young lady, would you like a question? Do you have a question? What would you like to ask? Just, oh, thank you. Do you think Dr. Seuss, do you think Dr. Seuss would, li would like um, the, mo the movie and the shows that they're making about Cat in the Hat? Do I think Dr. Seuss would like the movie The Cat in the Hat? I think, can I assume that's the specific question about that movie? I think Dr. Seuss would not have liked the movie The Cat in the Hat. I think Dr. Seuss would have liked Horton Hears a Who movie that came out this past year. Um, the Cat in the Hat, and Mrs. Audrey Geisel shares this opinion, was not a, fav a favorable movie in her opinion, although she was the executive producer and could have nixed anything she wanted, but um, the reality is I think that that movie did not correctly portray who he was. In fact, Dr. Seuss, even though he had a wonderful adult sense of humor, with his public persona as the best known children's book author, Dr. Seuss never crossed the line. He was never dirty. He never went there. And in that movie, I think there were some things that were inappropriate, that they thought were funny, but were kind of a little maybe dirty. But the truth is, I think Dr. Seuss would not have liked that. And Mrs. Audrey Geisel said after that movie, there will be no more live action Dr. Seuss movies. <laughs> Done. So, we did see now that there are the fully animated movies. And did you see the Horton movie? Did you like it? I agree. I think the Horton movie is an excellent presentation of who Seuss was and what Seuss did. And this is one of the difficulties of interpreting an artist. It's very difficult to interpret. And I don't think it was achieved in The Cat in the Hat. Thank you for that great question. Yes, ma'am. My favorite Zeus book is um, uh, Fidwick, the Big Hearted Moose, and so I just wondered, is there any fun story about that one or any background information that you could share? Um, you know, I don't have any, any personal stories that I know about that movie. I just know that it's a great, I mean, that, that book, it's a great story about this moose who's good-hearted, as, as the title says, and he lets everybody stay in his, in his uh, horns and live in his horns until he's carrying bears and birds and animals around. He's just maybe a little too generous. Uh, but it's a great book. It's a very early book. Um, it, it certainly has a message of, um, of um, watching what you ask for and what you invite into your home. Uh, not all of Seuss's books have these strong messages, but there certainly are a lot of them that have really great, powerful messages. And I think us parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles realize that when we read these books to our, our kids and, ne and nephews and nieces, we realize that it's working on one level for the children and it's working on another level for the adults. And I think that's also part of Seuss's genius, that he's able to accomplish both of those through the medium of a children's book. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I wonder about You know what? Seussical the Musical hit Broadway and like a lot of uh, Broadway shows, even some that have spiders in them. You know, they don't, they aren't reviewed very well and, and actually Broadway is probably not the best place for that. But I have to tell you, um, I have personally not seen it, but my understanding is that that 
is really has done very well in community theater and is very well received by the public. And I know that she's a supporter of it, and she certainly uh, has sponsored the, the creation of that. So my sense is that it's favorable. Yes, sir. He's seen Susical the Musical. I have seen Susical the Musical three times and recommend it very highly. And I have to say that everybody that I know who has seen it has given it good reviews or rave reviews. So my understanding is it's very good. And what that, what that Susical the Musical does is it weaves a lot of the stories and the messages from his books into this theater play. Excuse me. And so I think that that musical does the justice of giving you a lot of those wonderful messages in one hour uh, period. Yes, ma'am, back here. The book he wrote about getting old. Was that the book he wrote sort of when he was getting old? <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, Seuss did a book, and of course he did 44 children's books, so we don't know them all, but he did a book called You're Only Old Once. And yes, he was going through all sorts of medical issues, and, and that book, by the way, is brilliant. It is so wonderful, and if you go and get it and look at it, in the back, there's this pill drill page, and it's like a pool table with all of the pills laid out, and this one cures my morning gripes, and this one does this, and this one makes my eyebrows grow longer and bushier, and this one does this, and this one I take in case I... Um, die before I wake. <laughs> I love that book. It's a great one. A very little known, obscure book. Other questions? Right here. One of our family's favorites is the Lorax. Do you have any backstory about it? Well, the Lorax was also Ted Geisel's favorite book. And when you think about that, that's a pretty substantial statement. Uh, he had been thinking for many years about the environmental issues and resource conservation and really responsibility was that what that book is about. Uh, taking personal and corporate responsibility for our environment and of course the book is about the trees and the water. They don't have somebody to speak for them so the Lorax, he creates a, a character, the Lorax, who speaks for the trees. And Ted had been mentioning that, that all that he had read about the environmental movement up to that point was a bunch of highfalutin garbage is what he said. He said it just sounded like it was just so lofty and they couldn't quite get the message down to the, the, I think the, the, the extreme concept that he wanted to deliver and so he worked on that book to do that and while he was doing it he realized it's hard to deliver that message and it was very difficult and he didn't want to come off sounding like you need to clean up and recycle and do all the things that are important in the environment. That was not what he wanted to do. In fact, most of his children's books don't end with a moral. They typically end with a question. And the Lorax book ends with a question where the onceler, the corporate entity who in essence ruins the environment, has the last few seeds of the truffle trees which are all now dead and gone and he has the last few seeds and he throws them down to the little boy who he's telling the story through the entire book and he says it's up to you to decide what will happen. In essence it's up to us. The seeds are in our hands and we need to decide what we're going to do with them. So I think that that is a really important message of course but it was an important book to Ted Geisel it was written in 1971, many years before the Green Movement really took off. So again, he was ahead of his time, and his ideas uh, are really ev eventually proven to be mainstream. Yes, ma'am. Well, about that same book, um, the Super Axe Hacker. Mm -hmm. I really knew that the works in my classroom in the 7th uh, because it's environmentally and responsible and they're old enough to be responsible. And they really like the super axe hacker. So if you have any stories about the super axe hacker, my middle school students would really love that. Oh, great. I do not have a story about the super <laughs> axe hacker. Except for we... We need, yeah, exactly, we need fewer super X hackers in the world. <laughs> I, I don't know, I, honestly, I don't, except for um, that is really 
a hallmark of what he does in his children's books. He comes up with these crazy inventions, and you know it in The Grinch, and you know it in all these books. He creates things. He makes them up if he doesn't have them. And I love that, how he creates the super axe hacker. It's not one, because early in the book, they're just hacking down the trees, but now we need to hack down more, so the super axe hacker comes into creation. And that's Ted Geisel's brain just going, what can I invent? What can I create? And so it's just a wonderful invention. And I guess I would use it to, to um, inspire the kids to come up with, what would you create? What kind of machine would you create to counter the super axe hacker? And that's what Ted would do. Ted would say, let's get creative here and let's invent something that's going to stop those things from, you know, destructing trees. Yes, young lady? Why did he make the cat in the hat? Why did he make the cat in the hat? This is a great question. And in the 1950s, Literacy was, um, incre uh, illiteracy was on the rise, which means kids, more and more kids were not able to read or they weren't learning to read. And a gentleman named John Hersey wrote a book and an article called Why Johnny Can't Read, and I know a lot of us remember that. And in that article he said, you know, these Dick and Jane books that kids are learning, they're just not inspiring kids to learn. And in that article he said, why don't we have the geniuses of the day, the Walt Disney's, the Dr. Seuss's, create children's books for us. And Dr. Seuss took up the challenge. And a first grade reading book has, at that point, had 225 words they had to use. And Ted took those 225 words and he wrote The Cat in the Hat. So he wrote that book to help kids learn to read. He wanted to help in that effort. And ultimately, that is the greatest legacy that he leaves behind, is his contribution to children's literacy. So thank you for that question. Very important. Yes, ma'am? How did he come to use the name Dr. Seuss? And now that this is my last question, but thank you for that. Um, We've talked about him being at Dartmouth College. He went to school in the 1920s during Prohibition, yet he was caught drinking at college. And his uh, punishment was that he could no longer use, be the editor-in-chief of the College Humor magazine. It shouldn't surprise you to learn that he was that. But he actually um, was not allowed to contribute at that point forward. But kind of interestingly enough, all of these cartoons were appearing in the magazine by people that nobody knew. L. Lamott, Thompson, T. Seuss, because nobody knows your middle name in college. Ted Geisel. Who is T. Seuss? And eventually, Seuss. And then, remember I talked about him going off to Oxford and he was going to get his doctorate? Well, he never got that. He came back home and decided, I'm going to save my dad a lot of money and I'm just going to put doctor in front of my name. And that's how Dr. Seuss got his name. Thank you so much, folks. It's a pleasure to be here. Why did I spend all that money on that PhD? <laughs> I never thought of that. <laughs> I'm sort of speechless right now, actually, interestingly enough. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate your time and your dedication to the study of what we have coined Seussology. We're the beneficiaries of your hard work and your years of research and your dedication because we get to enjoy this new wonderful exhibit. If, you have, if you've not had a chance to see it, it is open, tonight is open, you can see it this evening. Or remember that Monday uh, the 21st is a free day, so bring the family back, the friends and family. President's Day, we're free on President's Day, Monday the 21st. You can see The Secret Art of Dr. Seuss, the permanent exhibit, exhibit of course, and the other temporary exhibit, Revolution and Rebellion, Words, Wars, and Figures. But as Bill mentioned, we also want you to mark your calendars and get ready 
because we're going wild this summer. <laughs> Elvis at 21, a photography journey of the king of rock and roll's walk to fame. They are absolutely beautiful photographs. We'll be here June 4th through August 11th. Following that is another, we're getting crazy. Stephanie and I are losing our minds. <laughs> From Nathan Sawaya. I told you, I told you I'd do it. Sawaya is the art of the brick, which will open on the first. And he is dubbed the Picasso of Lego bricks. He's a lawyer turned artist, and he turns, he uses Legos to create the most amazing artistic masterpieces. And I, the only thing I, I warn you, when Stephanie and I were there, we both wanted to do the same thing. You want to go out and buy Legos, and you think, I can do this. I know I can do this. This can't be that hard. Trust me. <laughs> it's true skill that you'll see um, in October. So we thank you very much for joining us here tonight. We thank you again, Bill, uh, for your work and for bringing the exhibit with us and this evening's um, entertainment. Please stop by downstairs while you're seeing the exhibit down in the lobby. Uh, there are some cocktails, very Dr. Susie cocktails, and food prepared by 42's award-winning chef, Mr. Jacob Peck. Thank you very much.